Uh, I'm Özgün, I'm the CTO at Citus Data and I'm excited to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a concept that's unique to Postgres called extensions. Uh, Postgres SQL already has uh, 300 extensions available. I think these extensions can change how we build, use and think about databases in the future. And before we start, I had a quick question for you. How many of you have heard of Postgres extension APIs? Or, cool, a fair bit. So I'll start this with a disclaimer. I uh, submitted two talks to PGCon. One was about the internals of Postgres and how you could apply it to scale out technologies. The other one uh, was about extensions, extension APIs, and how that's changing the face of relational databases. And uh, we compiled, I compiled these slides after going through a technical evaluation uh, after, uh, during our fundraising process. Uh, this was basically lots of technical experts in the database space coming and asking questions about PostgreSQL and Postgres extensions. So uh, the talk, the slides in the talk, assume that you don't know much about Postgres extension APIs. So anything you know, forget about them. Uh, that's how the talk is going to be interesting. And then I am going to go over five example extensions in this talk. If you're uh, too familiar with any one of them, I'm happy to skip over them as well. Just setting the context, the background on this uh, uh, particular slide deck. Cool. Uh, with that, let's get started with some introduction slides. I'm Özgün, the CTO at Citus Data. Uh, previously, I worked in the distributed systems engineering team at Amazon.com. I love Postgres. Our team also loves Postgres, and at Citus Data, we focus on scaling out Postgres SQL and making sharding simple. So you can focus on your application and not your database. Every single engineer in our team shares the same mission to make it so that you never have to worry about scaling your database again. And how do we do that? We do this by using something that's unique to Postgres called the extension APIs. And that's the topic of this talk. And I'll do something different today and start this talk with the punchline. If you're going to take away two things from this talk, uh, they are the following. First, Postgres gets many things right. It's open source, reliable, and comes with an advanced feature set. But if you look at all other databases out there, the one thing that's unique about Postgres is the extension APIs. So that's takeaway one. Second, these extensions are so powerful that they can change how we build databases in the future. And this talk is about those two topics, those two takeaways. First, what is a Postgres extension and what's unique about it? Second, why can these extensions change the database landscape? Third, extensions are a relatively new concept. As with any new concept, we face many preconceptions over the years about what relational databases can and can't do. For example, hey, relational databases can't process semi-structured data, or SQL doesn't scale. In this talk, I'll cover five example extensions that speak to those preconceptions. Because I'll show you five related but separate extensions, one way to think about this talk is as five separate lightning talks. This way, if you're super bored during the talk, you just have to wait it out for another three minutes or so, and I'll be talking about something completely different. And now finally, there is a demo at the end, uh, which Hadi prepared overnight that puts together some of these extensions, and I'll reserve five to 10 minutes to go over a powerful demo with different extensions working together. And hopefully, Hadi was saying he uh, has a few crashes. We won't see any crashes during this uh, futuristic demo. And with that, let's get started. First, what is a Postgres extension? In simplest terms, an extension is a packaged and versioned piece of software that adds functionality to Postgres. And at a high level, Postgres's extension framework offers two things. One, it defines the framework to build, initialize, and load related objects into Postgres. Two, it defines the contract and the APIs where a developer can hook into Postgres database modules with the intent to override, cooperate with, or extend them. And these APIs first became publicly available in Postgres 9.1, and with each new release, the Postgres community has been discussing and adding more extension APIs. 
And here's a list of database modules you can extend or override in Postgres's latest release. There are a few other ones in there, actually, like uh, logical replication, too. And of course, some of these modules also depend on other ones. For example, if you're writing a new data type up on the type system, uh, you may need to introduce new operators or new aggregate functions to operate on that new data type. Or let's say you're extending the query planner underneath for distributed execution, uh, you may need to, you probably need to extend the query executor together. In summary, you can override or change almost all database modules behaviors in Postgres. This way you can extend a particular submodule's behavior while also benefiting from diverse features built into Postgres over the years, I think over two decades. Now a natural follow-up question is, okay, this is interesting, this is cool, but why think about extending databases at all? Why are they so important? And why spend all this effort in modularizing an already solid database and provide APIs to extend any database module? The reason is that every decade brings new workloads for databases to handle. As a result, we see specialized databases emerge to handle each new workload. I think the past year has been about capturing more data in different shapes and form. And many commercial databases already took Postgres, forked from it, and built specialized databases for different workloads. And of course, when you fork, you start diverging from Postgres and its community. Over time, your database becomes a separate entity than the one that you forked from. What if you could leverage all the benefits of a vast ecosystem and a vast feature set and also build specialized databases for new workloads? That would be a game changer. Now, I don't take the word game changer lightly. In fact, we've been working on the extension APIs for over five years. And during this time, we talked to dozens of database experts and received plenty of critical feedback. And when we stepped back to evaluate this critical feedback, we found that it fell into two camps. One group of database experts asked if you could really hook into any database module's behavior. With them, we shared the previous slide that I just showed you about the different database modules, and then said, OK, you can just extend uh, any database mo module. The second group of database experts, who usually built new databases from scratch, had different thoughts. We realized that almost everyone in the second camp uh, perceived Postgres, probably because it's classified as a relational database, as this rigid, unchangeable database that already placed its technical bets. And almost everyone in this camp said that the extension APIs wouldn't be able to deliver what you would need for them to deliver to build your own specialized database. And so rather than discussing this idea in the abstract, we asked, OK, what specifically can't extensions do? Here are five specific workloads that we heard over the years. In fact, the complete list is longer. We also heard questions around graph databases, GPU processing, uh, data, pro uh, data auditing, and others. And most problem domains already had a Postgres extension that was in the works. For this talk, I picked uh, five example workloads that we heard frequently, and then that each have a fairly stable extension today. The most common obje objection that we heard two years ago when we did this was around handling semi-structured or unstructured data. Most people view Postgres as this relational database. You have DBAs. They create heavily normalized schemas. And then the NoSQL movement came in, and they heavily critiqued this formal approach and popularized the term semi-structured data. And in fact, both formal and semi-structured data types have their benefits. And over the years, Postgres added new data types to process various forms of semi-structured data. Today, the most popular of these extensions, and yes, it's not an extension, HStore was an extension, but you can almost think of it as an extension, uh, is the JSONB data type. It's the one that I have a few slides uh, right now. And before I continue about JSONB, I have a quick question. I assume some family, uh, people in the audience are already familiar with the JSONB data type. Uh, how many people would prefer that I skip over the JSONB slides? Okay, a minority, so I'll go and cover two slides on just rudimentary things on JSONB uh, with a very simple example. Uh, basically, in this example up here, oops, we're tracking books, very simplistic example. 
and each book has a unique identifier. And for all other attributes for a book, we create a column named data and store it as a JSON B column. We then enter data into this book table where we just pass a whole JSON string as a field value. Then we can query specific values uh, basically within the JSONB column. For example, this simple query here, uh, which is in here, uh, basically returns the book's title extracted from JSONB column and returns it as a column. And you'll note that we also have an arrow operator defined in here on the JSONB data type so that uh, you can query your semi-structured data in SQL. Are the slides visible, like what's in the slides from back there, by the way? Okay, awesome. And since you're extending Postgres, you can also do so much more with this JSONB column. For example, you can count the number of books that have an author defined. I know the example looks simple for Postgres users, but some of these aggregate functions are, were advanced features for the NoSQL camp at the time. And you can create a regular B3 index on one of the subfields in the JSONB column or you can create a generalized inverted index here down below, basically on the entire data column. And then uh, this way you can efficiently query your semi-structured data over billions of rows. Postgres will collect statistics about the underlying data and make use of gene indexes for fast processing. In summary, Postgres can store and process semi-structured data just as well as NoSQL databases. And Postgres comes with uh, close to 100 data types, if you include the extensions that serve many other use cases. Um, I was just looking up uh, this up on PGXN. There's a data type for Bulgarian national uh, ID numbers, so you can go crazy with this uh, extending the data types thing. And the nice thing is basically, if your data has unique properties, you can always extend Postgres and create your own data type. You can even add operators, aggregate functions, and even indexes that are tailored to your data. Questions? Cool. Now, a second question, a different question we answered, was related to an emerging workload, real-time analytics. In this workload, you run analytical queries over billions of rows and expect these queries to complete in under a second. For example, think about your Google Analytics dashboard or your customer-facing dashboard. When you log into your uh, Analytics dashboard, you can look at your statistics by hour, uh, by day, by month, or over arbitrary time periods. And to power this dashboard on billions of rows, you need to pre-compute certain attributes. For example, you can pre-compute the total number of users by day. And if the customer then asks for the total users over the past 10 days, you can easily adapt these user counts and then return them uh, to your application. But what happens when you need to show the total number of distinct users by any time interval? If you had 100 distinct users visiting your website yesterday, and if you have 100 distinct users visiting your website today, uh, do you have 200 distinct users visiting your website over two days? Yeah. And hyperloglog is basically an approximation technique for count distinct queries. HLL provides a fixed size set-like structure used for distinct value counting with tunable precision. And fortunately, there is already a Postgres extension with the same name that implements this algorithm. So let's think about the previous uh, example, the Google Analytics example. I cut it down just by a bit, uh, but then where we record user's visit to my website, like what they did, where they came in from. This table has billions of rows, so if you're doing sequential scans, that will take minutes. And we need to answer our questions in less than a second. So here, because we'd like to have a quick idea of how many unique users are visiting per day for my dashboard, like we create a pre-computed table, a roll-up table called daily uniques. It has this data type HLL in there. And the way this works is HLL is first ha hashing the user ID. Actually, it uh, uses multiple hashes and then aggregating those hashed values into one HLL data structure uh, by day. And then this is the insert into operator that you need to use to roll up into that uh, HLL uh, table. Now, uh, we can ask the cardinality of the HLL data structure for each day. Uh, this would basically give us the number of unique users per day. 
Of course, you could have done this with regular count distinct. But then, of course, uh, with the regular count distinct, you can only answer one question. With the HLL extension, you can answer many questions. For example, how many monthly unique users did my website receive over the past year? Which is basically this query on the HLL data type. Or the number of unique users who visited my website yesterday, but not today. These are just a few examples of the types of queries that would return in milliseconds in an HLL world, but it would require a lot of work if you were using the regular count distance. In summary, real-time analytics is an emerging workload for databases. Databases built for these workloads, such as Spark or MemSQL, come with approximation algorithms to provide sub-second response times. Today, Postgres can offer the same functionality through its open source extensions. HLL provides count distinct approximations through extending the data type, the user defined functions, and the aggregate function APIs. Top N uh, provides approximate answers for your typical group by, order by limit queries. T digest becomes helpful when you're pre computing percentiles across large data sets. So Postgres can not only provide fast and approximate query results, but more importantly, companies such as Newstar, Cisco, and Algolia are already using these extensions, these approximation extensions. That's our second lightning talk. Questions? Cool. Another workload that almost seems like the antithesis of relational databases is spatial databases. When you think of relational databases, you imagine normalized schemas that serve heavily transactional workloads. In this example diagram, however, we basically have a map of New York City that captures census data from each census block. And then this image shows the proportion of different uh, races as a percentage of the total population in the city of New York. And when you have an online transactional system, how do you analyze this type of data in Postgres? Is Paul in the audience, who is actually the primary author of the Postgres extension? Okay. Because if I am going to, I actually built this from the Postgres tutorials. If I go through this and then butcher any one of the examples, I would have asked him to correct me, essentially, for the upcoming slides. So this is one of the most popular extensions for Postgres that does just this. It turns Postgres into a geospatial database. You make Postgres a geospatial database by first creating the Postgres extension. Then you create any type of geometry, a point, a line, polygon, collection and add it to your table. And you can also run hundreds of functions that operate on these geometry types, or you can run location queries. Also, you can use these types, functions, or geospatial indexes as part of your regular SQL commands. In fact, the New York City map that we just looked at in the previous slide was served none other than by Postgres. And you can do much more with Postgres and Postgres. This example query shows the top 10 neighborhoods in New York, ordered by the proportion of people who have grad school degrees. And to do this, we were doing a geospatial join between NYC neighborhoods and census tracts, where the join operation determines which census tract polygons to include in each neighborhood's summary. Again, and that's the join here. And when issuing this geospatial query, we are both using the aggregate functions that come with Postgres here. And then uh, we're also extending the SQL syntax for basically geospatial joins. In summary, not only can Postgres become, can become a geospatial database, but also Postgres is the most popular spatial database if you look at Postgres's uh, Google search traffic versus other databases. And if you need more from your spatial database, you can easily extend Postgres with specific functionality. In fact, after enabling Postgres, you can install six additional extensions. These extensions enable other topologies, come with algorithms to process 3D objects, or help sanitize postal addresses. So there is no limit to what you can do with your spatial database. 
questions. Cool. That concludes our third lightning talk. The fourth set of questions we heard were around storage. Can Postgres be tailored to store and query data that's stored in different shapes or form? This question two years ago was the easiest one to answer. Postgres comes with these new extension APIs, or well, new at the time, called foreign data wrappers uh, that enable it to write to and read from any data source. For example, you could keep your data in S3 on AWS. You can then write a foreign data wrapper that knows how to connect to S3, scan over that data, translate that data into the format that Postgres expects. In fact, these APIs have become so powerful that people use them to query other databases, such as MongoDB and Oracle. And in the following slides, I'll talk about CStore FTW. CStore is a columnar extension that stores your data on a columnar format on disk. As such, it's an interesting example of what you can do with Postgres extensions. So CStore extends uh, Postgres for columnar storage. You create a columnar table in Postgres in here as if you were creating your regular table. The only difference is basically you're using the foreign table command. And then depending on the foreign data wrapper, uh, you can also specify certain op uh, options in here. In here, we're saying, hey, for compression, use the PGLZ algorithm. Now, when you create that table, uh, Behind the covers, CStore will store the data in a columnar layout. For the storage layout, CStore uses the optimized raw columnar org format uh, that the Apache Hive project uses. I'll read this diagram. So the way this works is basically CStore groups 150,000 rows by default uh, together. And then for 150,000 rows, it splits them into columns. So each 150,000 columns, 150,000 columns in here. And then each column set stripe in here basically has uh, 10K uh, blocks. So each column data in the set of 150,000 is grouped together and laid out on disk sequentially. There is one difference between the org and C store file formats. C store uses PostgreSQL data types as binary representation when storing data. This way, all Postgres data types become immediately compatible with C store. Questions on this diagram or the layout? And then you can then run your typical Postgres commands to ingest data. C store will store this data on disk using a columnar layout. You can then run your analytical queries on this columnar data to get insights. The nice thing is by speaking to the Postgres APIs, you can also leverage existing Postgres features. For example, I ran analyze in here before running my select. With this analyze command, when I run this command, Postgres will start collecting statistics about the underlying data so I can feed them into Postgres and then we'll use those statistics to optimize queries. In summary, it's true that the default uh, storage engine for relational databases has long been raw stores. However, it, that doesn't mean it's the only thing Postgres can do. In fact, Postgres already has over 100 foreign data wrappers, 106, I, I counted uh, before giving the talk, for very different workloads. And if you need more, Postgres comes with the APIs to scan and update foreign tables, lock rows, or even override the query planning and execution logic. Questions? I'll wait for a minute uh, for questions on this one. I'm moving faster than the time I allocated for questions. Okay, I'll go then on to my last lightning talk, if there are no questions. And this is the last, uh, and by far the most common objection we heard about relational databases. Postgres doesn't scale. Because the last, like the last decade has been about capturing more data in different shapes and form. This led to Hadoop and NoSQL databases. And it was these technologies in people's minds uh, that could help with the data scaling problem. In fact, we heard from many developers the statement, 
SQL doesn't scale. And when we dive deeper into that statement, we found that people actually made the statement in the context of very different uh, workloads. And because Postgres could handle all of these workloads, people expected it to scale out as well, like for all of those workloads. And by this point, I hopefully started convincing you about the answer. Postgres extensions. Citus is a distributed database that horizontally scales Postgres across commodity machines. To do this, uh, Citus shards and replicates data behind the covers. When a query comes into the database, Citus's query engine routes and parallelizes SQL queries across the machines in the cluster. Citus is packaged as a Postgres extension and it's available in three ways, as open source, as enterprise software, and as a fully managed database service on AWS. And you use Citus just like any other Postgres extension. You create the extension here, and then on the tables you'd like to shard, you just call this function, uh, create distributed table. And when you call this function, Citus will create shards for your table. From this point on, any commands and queries that you run on the system, including transactions and sub-transactions, will be distributed. You can plug in your favorite Postgres tool and continue operating as if you're talking to Postgres. To help visualize things, here's a simplified architecture diagram of Citus. Both the coordinator and worker nodes are Postgres databases that have the Citus extension loaded. So you go into each machine if you're setting this up yourself, and on each one uh, you say create uh, Citus, create extension, Citus, create extension, Citus. The user interacts with the coordinator node. This is where you create your distributed tables. When you create a distributed table, Citus creates shards on the worker nodes. So in here, each shard is basically a PostgreSQL table, and you typically have dozens, sometimes hundreds of them on each machine. And when you run a query against the cluster, you talk to the coordinator node with your Postgres libraries or tools. The coordinator takes that query that you send into the system, depends on the query, and I'll go, and it basically uh, replans that query, transforms it into its commutative form, breaks it up into smaller queries, and now pushes them to the worker nodes in the cluster. After each query, like after the query is complete, it does this asynchronously, coordinator merges the results and gives them back to the application. In short, the Citus cluster appears just like a regular Postgres instance to your application. Behind the covers, Citus will distribute your data and queries and will scale out Postgres across a distributed cluster. Uh, very good question. In this diagram, uh, we're not uh, using any of the partitioning machinery uh, except for a couple of the planning related stuff uh, to do the sharding. Uh, basically, Citus is hooking in and that is explicitly creating these shards uh, underneath as tables. Now, what we typically find our customers do, and more typically in real time analytics use cases, is they shard, say, on device ID or on user ID, and then they say partition by type. So, that's a, so you can take this after you've done the sharding in the previous example, you can say, now I want to further partition this table, typically that's time. So you have uh, in here, each one of these shards would have further partitions, uh, basically, where uh, you shard it on device ID and then you like with partition by time, and you get the benefit of both sharding and partitioning. And uh, Citus natively integrates with Postgres partitioning to enable for you to do that. Other questions? Cool. So when we started working on Citus, the database of choice among developers was NoSQL. And when we said Postgres, we'd often be dismissed as SQL doesn't scale. And it's very easy to dismiss a seemingly intractable problem by making a statement that trivializes the problem. And the best way to solve a complex problem is not by dismissing the problem, 
but by breaking it up into smaller problems and solving them one by one. Because scaling out many workloads is actually solving many small, uh, small problems. And at Citus, the Postgres extension APIs enabled us uh, to do just that. Here I include a few example customers who scaled out their relational databases by using the Citus extension. And over the years, we found that scaling out SQL is a very, very hard, but not an impossible problem to solve. There are, I'll go back to this infrastructure, the most typical way to set up replication in Citus is, it's not the only one, but the most typical one, you basically set up streaming replicas for each uh, node in your cluster. And uh, in the open source edition, you manage streaming replication and fail over yourself. In the enterprise edition and the cloud edition, basically, if one of the worker nodes fails, we have uh, machinery built in to automatically fail over to the replica. Mm -hmm. There are multiple answers, like there, there isn't one reason, there are multiple reasons for it. Uh, the most uh, obvious one, uh, the one that's easiest to explain is this. Think of, like you have two large tables, right? And now let's say you have one table that's sharded on user ID, you have another table that's sharded on company ID. I'm making up this example. And then uh, they're not co-located with each other. And now you want to do a join, a distributed join, uh, that merges them together, right? Like in this case, you need to take one of the tables and now you need to repartition that table, say the one on company ID on user ID. That's effectively a map reduce operation. So you take each shard, uh, you split that shard on like, let's say on the other side into 10 smaller files, each shard on the user ID. Now you do a distributed shuffle to push those files onto the ones uh, like, that have the user ID dimension, and then you do the join. So uh, in order to execute this uh, distributed shuffle or distributed map reduce, you need the Citus extension loaded on the worker nodes. Does that answer your question? There are other reasons too, but then that's the one that's easiest to explain uh, from uh, large table joins or, yeah. And this brings us to the end of our talk. In summary, Postgres extension APIs offer a unique way to build new specialized databases. In this talk, we went over five different workloads that we heard over the years as something relational databases aren't designed to handle. We then showed five extensions that are designed just for these workloads. These extensions are used by thousands of companies in the world. More importantly, you can use these extensions by themselves or use them in combination. In fact, there is nothing stopping you from using your JSONB for semi-structured data, Postgres for geospatial analysis, C store for compression, and Citus to scale out all of them together. To conclude, Postgres 10 enables you to extend any database module, and Postgres equals extensible architecture puts it in a unique place for adapting to evolving hardware trends and business trends. We believe this extension architecture is a game changer uh, for the database market. It could just be that the monolithic relational database is dying. If so, long live Postgres. Thank you. <laughs>